be here. I appreciate the invitation and appreciate uh, Liberty Faith Bible Church. I love this church and I love the people. Um, I consider... Huh? I gotta turn you down. You're a little loud. Like this? Yeah, we okay. <laughs> Where's the power transmitter? Not yours. Oh, so. Right here. Right there. I can stand behind you, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know how that is. Um, but I love this church. I consider your pastor my pastor, and and uh, I, I don't mind uh, sharing his name out in public. In fact, that's how a lot of you heard about him. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, Brother Reg, when you die, can I have your church? Can I have it? Oh, I have. I have. Uh, take your Bible and open it. Take your Bible and open it. We'll get we'll uh, we'll get there in a little bit. You see up on the screen, and I hope you can see well enough on the screen. Um, this is where my heart is. Uh, I prayed about uh, what to talk about. I like to say, Brother Reg didn't tell me. Anything you want me to preach on, left it up to me, and I appreciate that confidence. I really do. And um, I want to get along with everybody. I want everybody to like me, but I, God gave me the gift of opinions. And when you have opinions, you're not going to make everybody happy, okay? Especially when you vocalize those opinions. And you can see the faces of people as they were smiling at you for a minute, and then they're going... <laughs> And then they're, they're trying to politely dismiss themselves from your presence. And so I've had that happen a lot with uh, people in our church over the years. I've been there, uh, let's see here, November of 1994. I will have been there 30 years, the first two years as like an assistant pastor. And under some very, very, very dark circumstances in 96, became pastor there. And uh, I did not believe then what I'm going to share with you now because I went to Bible college. In fact, I went to two different ones. And they, they uh, took out of me what some good preachers put into me, and that was the Bible is the Word of God, has no mistakes in it. And so God had to put that back in. It wasn't a Bible college, it wasn't a preacher, it wasn't anybody in the church. Uh, God had to put that back into me, and I'm very thankful and very grateful that He did. And so we were surrounded by a sea of Bibles. Or so-called Bibles. There's Bibles everywhere. You can get them at the Christian bookstore. You can get them from Amazon. You can order them from any hundreds of hundreds of websites online. You can even go to Walmart and buy Bibles. You can go to Costco. You can go to uh, Sam's Wholesale Club. You can buy Bibles everywhere. The problem is, yeah, the problem is, are they all the same? It stands to reason. That if one Bible copyrights its material against a previous book that is out under the same title, copyright law says that that other book it would be a, what is called a derivative work. It has to be significantly different from its original before they can claim exclusive rights to it. Zondervan claims and has the exclusive rights to the NIV. Thomas Nelson has the exclusive rights uh, to the New King James Bible. And in America, and in Canada, and in any place where the United Kingdom does not hold power over that nation, the King James Bible is not copyrighted. You can copy it as much as you want to. And if you are some kind of devil dog, you can change the words in it if you want to. There's no restrictions on it. However, I learned from a man in uh, the UK several years ago. I believe he's now going to be with the Lord because I haven't heard from him. He's either dead or he don't like me no more. But he used to call all the time, Mike, this is Barry from England. And he didn't have to say the England part because I knew it was him. <laughs> and he had a little ministry. He handed out tapes of uh, King James... Bible preachers that he liked, and he's, he was giving out mine. And I said something about the copyright, and he said, Mike, it's not true. He said, the Bible, the King James Bible in the United Kingdom is, has a form of copyright. When King James of England 
had this Bible translated, he put it under what's called the Royal Letters Patent. In other words, he patented the Bible, not under his own name, under the crown of England. So that as long as King James sat on the throne, no one could legally change the words of the Bible that they had spent seven years translating. No one could. But after he died, what about that? Well, he didn't put it under his own name. He put it under the, the throne, the crown. So as long as the crown remains in the United Kingdom, no one can change the words of the King's Bible. How about that? You like that? Say amen. Because, and this is what he told me. He said, Mike, the Sodomites tried to sue Cambridge and Oxford universities. They're the two um, copyright holders of the King's Bible in England. And if you want to print from that Bible, you must, uh, you must get their permission. And he said they sued Cambridge and Oxford because they didn't like the word Sodomite. They said it made them look bad. No, I think them winter dress makes them look bad. But anyway, they sued and lost because the court said not even, not Cambridge, not Oxford, and not this court has any legal right to alter the words that are in the Bible because they are under the royal letters patent that only the king can authorize any changes to that Bible. And over 400 years, it's never been changed, not one time. And don't let those guys tell you that, well, you believe the King James, what King James do you believe in? Do you believe in the 1611 King James Bible or do you believe in the 1729 King James Bible? Or do you believe in this? Because they want to tell you that they're all different. Robert Piccarelli. I sat in a conference that he held with Free Will Baptist pastors and I was on the other side then, and he garnered that question, which King James Bible do you believe in? And I fell for it. Then a few years later, my wife bought me for my birthday a replica of the 1611 King James Bible, and I started reading it. And I found out that all the words were the same. That guy lied to me. I didn't take it well either. So that's why I don't mind telling his name. I don't know if he's dead or alive. I don't care. But he lied to everybody. And I passed on that same lie until I found out the truth. If you want to read something, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a book. And if you go to books.google.com, there is a PDF of a book that came out in the mid-1800s. The American Bible Society uh, was asked that same question. Do we have the Bible unaltered here for us in 18, I think it's 1850. Has the Bible come down to us unchanged since 1611? So their scholars got together, they did the research, they came together and they wrote this little booklet. And here's basically what it said. That as far as the words itself... The Bible from 1611 to now 1850 has come down to us totally 100% unchanged. Now, there are changes, what they call orthography, which means spelling. And they said there are printing errors. And they gave a list, a, short, a sort of a short list of all the words that had been put into the 1611 Bible that were obvious printing errors. But as far as the words themselves, I could stand up here with a 1611 Bible and read to you verse by verse by verse, and you would not be able to tell the difference between what I'm reading and the Bible you're reading. Somebody say amen. amen. You'll have to excuse me every now and then. And if there's a bottle of water around here somewhere, I'll take it. I have real dry mouth from some medicine I'm taking for my nerves and so on, and those of you know I was electrocuted and it still bothered me to this day, so just bear with me, all right? But you see all these Bibles up here. So I'm going to ask you, if, if you were like me, on a day where, thank you very much, yeah, I said a little bottle of water, didn't I? <laughs> I'll just fold this up and put it in my pocket for later, okay? Um... If you're like me, 
and you're listening to this, whether, whether you're sitting here, whether you're listening in somewhere in the United States to this, uh, so Liberty Faith is streaming it, and Bethel Church is also streaming this. Uh, if you live in Kenya, one of our radio stations there, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. And I'm going to ask you three very important questions. And I've done this before up in Fargo, and, uh, and a guy, oh, he came after me on this. But the first question I want to ask you is, who inspired your Bible? Everybody on the internet's got an opinion about something. And they all want to say, oh, the Bible was written by men. The Bible was written by men. We don't follow the Bible. Even people who claim that they know all the mysteries and all the secrets, and they're, they keyed in on all the conspiracy theories, those guys especially, you don't listen to them. They will try to tell you that King James was queer. They will try to tell you all kinds of lies, that the Masons got in, involved in that, and so on and so on. There's not a shred of evidence that even says that is true. And so even if, let's just play devil's advocate, even if King James of England was a sodomite, a closet sodomite back then, he personally had nothing to do with the translation of that Bible. Fifty-four men, some Anglican, some Puritan, and whenever they couldn't figure out or were unsure about a certain passage of Scripture, thank you very much, certain passage of scripture, they sent word out to all the ministers, what they called the divines in that area. They told them, said, we have a problem here. We're not sure exactly how to translate this. Will you help us? And so more than 54 men working in a circular fashion where every group is overlooking every other group's translation so that no, no personal doctrine is, is implanted into the translation that it's straight down the line. Then you'll get people to say, well, when they translated King James Bible, they didn't just use the Greek and Hebrew. They used other translations. Turn to first. In fact, I have this in my notes, but turn to first Peter. First or second. Pick one. Uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, it's not the one I wanted, it's 2 Peter, thank you. Yeah, there you go. 50-50. Um, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. That means Peter said, I heard God's voice. Say, this is my beloved son. I heard it with my own ears. We're not, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. I heard God's voice say, Jesus is the Son of God. But he said, we got something better than that. I got a short, more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. The day star is not Lucifer. Amen. Amen. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. That word interpretation is the same word that's used all throughout the Bible. Uh, when Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So the word interpretation doesn't mean how you personally see this verse. It means how was it translated from one language to the next? And no prophecy of the Bible, no word of the Bible. Thank you. No word of the Bible, no verse of the Bible anywhere, can, can be translated unless it matches the other vernacular translations. So they went and looked at Luther's German Bible. They went and looked at the previous Bibles in English that had come along, the Wycliffe Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and the Geneva Bible. They compared those, and they, and they looked at, let's see, the Italian version, the French version, or Spanish version, any, any vernacular translation of the Bible, they looked at because they said, if God said it in English, he's going to say the same thing in German. There's not a different gospel for the Germans, amen, or for the Spanish, or for anybody else for that matter. It's the same gospel and the words have to match. So that's why they did it. And you'll see on the front piece of your King James Bible with the former translations diligently compared and revised. They were following Scripture in doing that. Amen? So, number one, who inspired your Bible? Was it inspired by men? Was it the evil patriarchal church? Those evil men that just wanted to own women as property and on and on. Who inspired your Bible? Well, number one, 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. How much Scripture? All Scripture. And let me ask you this. 
Does God do anything that's outside of Scripture? No. I've had people tell me, Mike, not everything that God does is in the Bible. And I'd say, well, how do you know that? Give me a verse that proves that. Well, there isn't one. See, God does some things that are outside of the Bible. Look at this verse. The, the Scriptures are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, because you're wrong about things for correction, for instruction in righteousness, because we know how to sin, we just don't know how to live right. The Bible tells us how to live right. Uh, Thoroughly furnished unto most good works is not what it says. It says thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So if God said uh, that my scriptures has all the things that I want man to do, and I want all the things about me given in, that, in this one Bible... You can rest that everything that God does is right inside this book. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but He revealed His secret to the service of prophets. Amen. Second Peter, this, I should have just turned my notes over here. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Revelation 1. Here's what Jesus said to John, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book. You guys, most of you guys out here, you're landowners. And the land that you have is precious to you. Would you, would you dare ever buy a piece of land that somebody offered to you without a title? Why not? Can't prove ownership. Can't. Prove ownership. Some guy may be selling something that doesn't really belong to him legally, and he's taking your money, and you've got nothing to show for it. It must be written down. Amen? We wouldn't buy a used car. We wouldn't buy a 1995 minivan without having some form of title. Amen? We wouldn't do that. We're talking about salvation here. It's got to be written down. What thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. So, who inspired your Bible? God did. Jeremiah. And here's the method. The Lord poured forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down and destroy and throw down and build and to plant. Ezekiel 3, similar Similar way, moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll, and he said, Now, son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I have given thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweet. All oh, reading the Bible, sweet. Amen? Amen. 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 But God, both in both places, he took his words. In various forms, he put it in Jeremiah's mouth, and he said, Now, go say those words. Yeah. Ezekiel, he wrote them down in a book. Told Ezekiel, eat the words. Preachers, you cannot preach what you did not read. I Listen, I am not against stealing Reg Kelly sermons. I've done it several times. I made them a lot better. Okay? But I would not preach anything that I personally have not read for myself. Amen. All right, now, so I think we're getting all clear. The voice which I heard from heaven. See, John almost did exactly the same way as Ezekiel. The, the angel that said that, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And when I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey, just like Ezekiel. So you have an Old Testament witness and a New Testament witness. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Four is the number for the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so right now, this is true. Because even though John is dead... His, the words that he ate and the words that was given to him are being spoken and prophesied all over the world to peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. you believe that? Say amen. amen. I'll tell you what, God's not wrong. Amen. amen. Now, we're going to get into this. We've established that, um, that God is the one who inspired 
your Bible. Is everybody okay with that? Believe it or not, all your liberal churches, all your, uh, your party house churches, all the denominational churches, they pretty much all say the same thing. All the universities, all the scholars, all over America and all over Canada and all over the world, they all say the same thing, that we believe the Bible is inspired in the original manuscripts. And they love saying that. It makes them sound spiritual. But, they never, they never say original manuscript unless they finish the thought. But, we don't believe that the Bible came down to us in perfect condition. And I've got something, if I get time, I've got to do this, no matter if I do anything else. I've got to show you what God showed me this week about your DNA and this question. Are the copies the same as the original? So, second question I'm asking you is who preserved your Bible? God inspired it. But did God preserve it? Now you've got two, you got two issues here, two sides. If you say that God preserved your Bible, knowing the nature of God, would God have allowed any errors to come into those manuscript copies? The answer is no. If you do not believe that God preserved His Word, then you would say, obviously, there are mistakes and errors in the transmission of texts over the years. What you can't do is say, I believe God preserved the Bible, but I believe it contains errors in it. That is a contrary to the nature and character of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Can you prove what you believe? Let's, let's say you're on this side. You're on the side of, I think there are errors in the manuscripts. If you're on that side, can you show me scripture? Not scripture that you think didn't get translated right or copied right. Can you show me any place in the Bible where God said that there would be errors or that his word would corrupt? Can you show me any place? Can you show me one verse? I need two. Can you show me even one verse where God said that his word would fall into corruption? Amen. Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words, and silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou, say this loud, loud with me. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation for how long? Amen. Amen. And you know what? We have living proof of it right here. This is the Bible that has not been altered in over 400 years. Okay? Now, if I had an NIV up here, which I don't, touch not the unclean thing, amen? But I did some research. The first edition of the NIV came out in 1973. They came out with a New Testament. That New Testament then, they added the Old Testament by 1980. From 1973 to 2024, the NIV has been changed five significant times since 1973. If you have a 1973, I had one of my girls do this. She was, she took the, I found a, a 1973 NIV New Testament at a Goodwill store and I bought it. And I had her go through just various places in the New Testament and compare the, the 1973 version with the 2024 version. She's got a list of all these verses that are different now. Remember what I said. If you have a derivative work, that, that work must be significantly different than the one it derives from. So in order for Zondervan to have a new copyright on their current Bible, which is the gender neutral Bible, it's the gender neutral, the one they tried to sell us back in the 90s. And, and the American churches said, that's not, uh-uh, we're not doing that. Look at where we are now, 30 years later. They, they snuck it in 
that was for a while the TNIV, today's New International Version, and then they just made it the NIV period, the end. So you will find it significantly different than the one came out in 1973. However, and, and let me say this too while I'm on this subject. I've lost my microphone. Here we go. When I was in Bible college, they handed me a book. Novum Testamentum Grecium. New Testament Greek. And it was the 27th edition of the, what started out as the Westcott Hort, then it became the uh, Nessel Aland, named after Eberhard Nessel, who was in the 1800s, and Kurt Aland, who lived in the 20th century. It was named after those two men because uh, Kurt Aland was on the United Bible Society, which is in charge of the Greek New Testament. From the 1984 version of the New Testament that they gave me in Bible college to now, they've gone to the 28th edition of the Greek New Testament and they are working on the 29th edition of the Greek New Testament which means that the 29th edition will be different than the 28th and which was different from the 27th. I wonder if it has anything to do with the Vatican because since 19, in the 1980s that that committee has had two Jesuit priests on the payroll. The 1980s and on into 1990s into the year 2000 Carlos Martini, who was in line to be the Pope, he sat on the translate the uh, Greek New Testament committee uh, as the Vatican's voice or the Jesuits voice over that. By I wouldn't have it just for that reason. But then when he died, they hired another uh, Jesuit cardinal, Cardinal Pisano, and he now is on the committee. It's, it's almost like, hey, we got to have a Jesuit on the committee. When one goes off, they stuck another one on there. They're not interested in preserving the word. They're interested in making the Catholic Church happy. Is why they're doing it. Anyway, moving. So, what I'm saying is, the Greek New Testament keeps changing. Therefore, the Bibles that are translated from it must also keep up with the changes. You are, If you own anything but a King James... You are never, ever, ever going to have a static, unchangeable word. You're never going to have that. It'll always be altered. Exodus 17, 4, the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. Isaiah 30, verse 8, write, write it for a memorial. Why? Write it in a book. For what reason? So we can re remember it. So that we can memorize it. So that the words that I send down from heaven will be remembered from this generation to that generation to that generation all the way down to your generation. You have the Word of God. Write this for a memorial in a book. Isaiah 30. Write it before them in a table. And note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That's why God said write it down. That's why on Mount Sinai in Exodus 20 when God spoke the Ten Commandments to the Israelites, He then called Moses up and wrote the Ten Commandments down. So there's no misunderstanding. So nobody can say, well, I, I didn't hear that adultery part. I didn't hear God say that. I, don't th I think y'all are making that up. Moses comes down and says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Whoops. This has been written so that we all follow the same rule book, same laws. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall not pass away. Exodus 34, and the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables. Oh, I like this. Why did he have to bring another t set of tables up to Mount Sinai? Because the first ones vanished away, didn't they? Just like the original manuscripts. We don't have them. So God said, Moses, come back up here, bring two tables with you. I'm going to write the words down again because I preserve my word. That happened in Exodus. That happened with Jehoiakim. And it came to pass when Jehudi read three or four leaves, he cut it with a pen knife, cast it in the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. So verse 27, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that. The king had burned the roll and the words which Barak wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll. And what if Jeroboam or Jehoiakim would have thrown that in the fire? 
God would have said, I can do this all day long. I can, I can make copies. I can make them faster than you can burn them. And write it in all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. God is not only giving you the doctrine of preservation. He's showing you by example that he, if the word gets destroyed, we're going to make another one to fill its place. Amen. Amen. You never, ever have to worry about some government entity or the devil himself taking the word away from you. If you're saved and you're right with God, God will preserve that word in you. Amen. That's the only reason why I'm up here today. Only reason why I can stand today. Isaiah 4. Turn to Isaiah 4. You don't like this. Isaiah 40. Boy, I like this. The two things that the early writers of the scriptures had to write on, number one was papyra, papyrus, and number two was vellum. Papyrus is from the papyrus reed. It's a very tall, thick grass. And they would t it would grow in marshes. And they would take it, the Egyptians figured this out, they would take it and they would cut it, and then they would splice it lengthways, and they would take the layers out, and they would weave them together. Once they were woven together, they would flatten them out and lay them out before the sun to dry, and that's where we get the word paper from. Okay? Papyrus, paper. So, they wrote on grass. Then, vellum is... Uh, an animal skin of some kinds, uh, oftentimes it would be goat skin or lamb skin. And they would take the skin, a very thin skin, like from the belly area, and they would take it and stretch it out. I don't know how exactly they prepared it, but they also would let it dry out in the sun. And then they would take and they would write on that animal skin, vellum, they would write out the words that God told them to write down. So we have the two things here. God, is, God has his men writing on grass. And God has his men riding on flesh. So Isaiah 40, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. They're the same. And all the goodness thereof is the flower of the field. The grass withereth. The flower fadeth because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth. The flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So these scholars that say original manuscripts, original manuscripts, original manuscripts, original manuscripts, all of those guys who say that, they haven't read their Bible. Or at least God's just hiding this from them, and because of their arrogance, he won't let them know it. But here it is, here it is, that they know that the original manuscripts have gone away, and so they automatically make the conclusion that we can't really know exactly what God said at any given place because the original manuscripts have faded away. Well, that's what they're expected to do, and that's what God said that they were going to do. Doesn't matter if it's written in flesh, doesn't matter if it's written on grass, it is going to fade away. However, God said, don't worry. I will always find a way to preserve the words of God. They will stand forever. Amen. Amen. Now, Peter quoted this verse, and he put it in the, in the correct frame of the gospel. If you are reading the wrong Bible, eventually you will be reading the wrong gospel. Now... Some pastors, 1973, 1980, they may have looked at the NIV and they say, well, I don't see what the big deal is. I mean, this is very similar to the King James. But remember, they've changed it five times since then. So now what? Are they going to keep changing it? Are they going to make it better? Men don't make things better. Just like doctors. Amen. <laughs> Being born again. Not a corruptible seed. Not from a Greek New Testament that is constantly being altered by Jesuits. If your, if your seed by which you're born is corrupt, your birth is corrupt. Amen. 
Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. It means that not only has it not been corrupted, it is not capable of being corrupted. Amen. By the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and all the glory. Now he's quoting Isaiah. Verse 25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached. Again, if the word you preach is corrupt, your people will be corrupt. By the way, I'm going to talk about DNA here in a minute. Uh, i got a lot to go, and I have very short time, but there's one thing I am going to get to you today about DNA. And I'll tell you what, it, it, it'll sell itself to you, okay, when you understand it. This is the DNA of every born-again Christian. This is your DNA right here. Psalm 139.16 In thy book all my members were written. Amen? So if you're born again of incorruptible seed, you, this is your DNA right here. Would you allow somebody to alter it? No! No! Because you have no idea what, what that will produce. You just know it can't be good. So, if, well, let me get into that later. So, who inspired your Bible? Who preserved your Bible? Now, this third question, I, I know some well-meaning, good pastors have known them throughout my life that use the King James... But they just haven't made that step over. And they would say, you know, I use the King James, but I just don't think that a translation can be inspired. Okay? I'm not trying to be a know-it-all. I'm not trying to be uh, someone trying to expose you or whatever. I'm here to help you. Because that was the thought that I had at one time. Okay, I can handle God preserving the manuscripts. But can he preserve it and can he translate it? But when you ask that question, who translated your Bible? Again, we're, we're forced with this issue of if you believe that God translated your Bible, then you must believe that it was all translated perfect. And that God didn't make any mistakes with it. If you don't believe that God was involved in the translation process, then by, by its very nature, you believe that there are mistakes in all translations. And this is really the key here. You're not going to find anywhere in the Bible, King James Bible. You're not going to find that. You'll find King. You'll find James. But not the same place together. But what we're looking at is, did God translate his word correctly? Or did God translate it at all? Well, so they would say, I don't believe a translation can be inspired. Revelation 7. Notice who's in heaven. Notice who's around the throne of God. After this I beheld in lo a great multitude which no man could number of all what? Nations. Nations. All kindreds. Amen? Amen. All people. Amen. And tongues. Amen. God spoke to them in their language. Makes sense, doesn't it? <clears throat> I mean, is it only going to be English-speaking people in heaven? If I believed that, I wouldn't be spending all the money we're spending to keep the radio stations going in Kenya. Because I guarantee in Turkana right now, there's a guy trying to keep up with me translating what I'm saying in the Turkana language so that people can hear it. You pray for him. Amen? He's, he's got to have God helping him translate those words correctly. All right? So, all people, all kindreds, all nations, and tongues stood before the throne. Now, Isaiah 28. God says this to Isaiah. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now, Moses was stammering lips. Wasn't he? And, and, and that was for a reason. Moses was hard of speech, therefore the Jews could not, they, to this day, they cannot understand Moses. They can't understand who he was who he is portraying, who he was a type of. They don't understand it, that he is the lawgiver, and Christ is now the new lawgiver. Which is another reason why you should support Israel. Our Savior is a Jew! Amen! Amen. 
All right. And if he loved his own people, you ought to love them too. Then we have another tongue. God was prophesying that, okay, I gave you Moses. He had stammering lips. But one of these days, I'm going to speak to you in another tongue. And you're not going to like it. Because I'm not speaking Hebrew anymore. I'm going to speak Greek. And I'm going to speak all the, the Parthenian and the Cretes. I'm going to speak in all of their language. And you Jews are just, you're not going to like it. Because now I'm going to provoke you to jealousy by a people who are not, pe are not a people. Amen? Amen? So in Acts chapter 2, they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we ever man in our own tongue, wherein we were born Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia, and Judea, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Do you think, you think they made any mistakes? No, they didn't make any mistakes. They were under the direct power of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. It is not possible for God to lie. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 14. Turn your Bible there. I want you to see this. If, if you haven't seen this, you're going to like it. When, when God confirmed in my heart that this Bible was right and it had no mistakes in it, I accepted it. But I wanted evidence. And I wasn't really a manuscript scholar. And I knew that I probably would not be able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against somebody that knew the manuscript evidence because they would probably know something that I wouldn't know. And here's what I'm going to say to all you folks. You're going to have people challenge you. Somebody told me uh, yesterday or last night that they've got family members now that hate their guts over the King James issue. They just don't. They just I think you're in some kind of cult or something like that. I don't know. But they will come against you over this Bible issue. And, they, and, and there's always going to be somebody who's going to try to uh, sneak in a question to you. He's going to throw a fiery dart at you. And it will be a question that he believes that you don't have the answer to. And it, since you don't have the answer to it, that means he's right and you're wrong. Okay? Don't fall for that. Don't chase it. Answer not a fool according to his own folly, lest thou be also like unto him. Don't answer their questions. Ask them one simple question. Show it to me in the scriptures. Show me a Bible verse that says that God doesn't speak anything but Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Because that's the language that we're dealing with here. Most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. A portion of it was written in Aramaic, which is like the first cousin to Hebrew. But then, it's a dip because we have a new lawgiver, we have to have a necessity, a new law. And that new law was written in a completely different language than the original law. Does that make sense to everybody? Because God wanted it known. I'm not just saving the Jews. I'm saving the Greeks. And the term the Greeks in the New Testament always referred to the whole of the Gentiles. Amen. So we have the New Testament written in a completely different language, which is not really related to Hebrew or Greek. So, 1 Corinthians 14. This is the rules on speaking in tongues that are not known. I would say that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret. Amen. Because God said that the church may receive edifying. So if one of you jumped up and you started speaking in some language, that maybe it's Swahili or Greek or whatever, nobody here would know that. So unless you give a proper Holy Ghost-led interpretation... You're just speaking into the air. You're like a barbarian to the rest of us. So an unknown tongue must be translated. God said it. God said it. So verse 13, Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. That's twice now. Now, notice in verse 21, Paul is quoting Isaiah. Isaiah uh, 28 11 what we just read here 
With stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. By the way, um, I don't have a marker here. That picture of Moses there, I asked artificial intelligence image creator to draw me a painting of Moses standing with the, holding the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai with the glory of God surrounding him. And it drew that. This one is pretty scary. Where AI is going to, it's getting pretty scary. Now, um, notice that Paul in verse 21, 1 Corinthians 14, he's quoting Isaiah 20 and 11, but it's different. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips. Will I speak unto this people? Did Paul have the authority to say what he said here? The answer obviously would be yes, because scripture cannot be broken. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So if the Holy Ghost wants to add something to Isaiah 28, 11, he just did it. It's God's word. Amen. It's not Paul's. It's not ours. You can't say, well, he was reading from the, you know, the Greek Old Testament. He was reading the Septuagint is what they called it. He was reading from that. That's why it's all wrong. No, I believe he got it right. Amen. With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. So now God is saying, I'm not going to just speak to them in one language. I'll speak to them in multiple languages. In their languages. So, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, three unknown tongues. Now look at verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and that by course, and let one interpret. Amen. There it is. Amen. Oh, I like it. I like to get out all the translation. And look at all of them, and I, then I get a sense of what God is saying. No, you're just more confused now than you ever were. Amen. Because as God would not allow multiple interpretations of those three unknown tongues, He does not allow it concerning His Word. For God is not the author. What does an author do? He is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. So what applies in the Corinthian church applies to all of the churches. Let one translate what the two, or at the most three, said that you don't know what they are. In fact, you can't even read the letters. So how can you know the words? And once you know the words, how do you know what they mean? It just doesn't make sense. Now, I'm going to move ahead here just for a minute. You have patience with me. I want to switch over to DNA. Um, oh, i I got to show you. Hang on a second. Bear with me. Okay, let's go to the very beginning on DNA. Um, let's see here. Through faith we have to understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. What is it that created everything? The Word of God. Uh, His name is called the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. The Word of God is Jesus. You cannot separate Christ from His Word, nor His Word from Christ. Amen. The phrase, by the Word, is mentioned 21 times. That's 7 times 3. The phrase, Word of God, 7 times 7. That's 49 times in the King James Bible. In John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Amen? And when you capitalize the letter W in Word, you'll find it's in the King James seven times exactly. Unless you take out 1 John 5, 7. Then you've ruined it. All right? Now, hang with me here. So the method of God building man or making man was he spoke it and God said let us make man in our image after our likeness notice the three us our and our that's because father word holy ghost let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female he and she and Zay and Zim and them and no. Only two genders. Created he them. So when Adam was created, 
He was made in the image of his father. And isn't it amazing that if you look at like especially famous people, the ones that have a son, there's Clint Eastwood and his son. Notice his son looks like Clint Eastwood from back years ago when he was making them spaghetti westerns. You have Tom Hanks and his son bear striking resemblance. The two on the bottom there is, um, oh, it's a Canadian, uh, Eugene Levy and his son. He's a comedian. He's an actor. They look a lot alike. Uh, Kiefer Sullivan, Donald Sutherland, they both have the same shape to their face. You can tell that one is the son of the other. Arnold Schwarzenegger has a son that looks like him back in the old days. Uh, Rob Lowe, there's his son there, looks just like him. And even uh, Joe Biden. <laughs> and they like father, like son, right? They just, they sniff things, amen. Psalm 139, 16. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. Now, Psalm 139 is the chapter where he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully not evolved, made. Uh, when I show you the, the absolute complexity that is DNA, I would say that, I'm, and being nice about it, but you're a total idiot for believing that DNA happened by chance. Not even Francis Crick. Francis Crick was the physicist, along with Watson, who won the Nobel Prize for, they were the first to figure out the double helix nature of DNA. And Francis Crick said that the odds that DNA formed all by itself, by accident, there's more molecule, oh no, it, the odds that that happened by accident is, great, is a greater number than all of the atoms in the universe. He didn't believe that it just happened by accident. Now, um, let me get to something. Boy, to just knock your socks off, all right? I, if I get a chance tonight, I'll go through this, okay? Now, uh, okay, right here. Very quickly, and I'm going to be done. Genesis 5, turn there and underline this in your Bible. Genesis 5, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Notice you have the word gene there. And there's a reason. Gene, genetics, those words, and generations, they're, they're linked together by that prefix gene so is the word genesis they're all linked together because they have to do with the beginning of something the start of something so Adam was the first man in the earth there were no monkeys before him amen no half men nothing like that this is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God may he him and in verse 5 it says all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died so 930, if you were to go to the 930th chapter of the Bible, you're in Matthew chapter 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. I've known this for years and I get doodads just talking about it. Yeah, God put, the, God put everything in the Bible where it's supposed to be. Now, you can say, oh, I don't believe that. I just gave you a fact, okay? That's my, that's my security team going down the road there. I just gave you a fact. You can't deny the fact. You may not like the conclusion, but you cannot deny the fact. Adam lived 930 years and he died. The Old Testament is death. The law is death. The, new te the, the, the letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. The New Testament is full of the spirit. That's where our, sal our salvation is not at Mount Sinai. Our salvation is Mount Zion, amen, in heaven. So the book of Adam, 930 years. Book of Jesus Christ, 930th chapter. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, amen. Now, I like to drink Diet Mountain Dew. And fried chicken... And ice cream, cornbread and beans, 
and a good juicy hamburger. Now, my body needs insulin. So does your body. Everybody's body needs insulin. Where do you get it from? Do you get it from Diet Mountain Dew? You get it from fried chicken? How about cornbread? No. There is nothing that we eat that contains a packet of insulin so that insulin, insulin is so cool. Picture, if you will, the cell, the human cell. And you have this sugar that your liver has converted everything that you eat into sugar. So you got this sugar in your bloodstream and it's to be delivered to all the cells in the body because the, the cells need the sugar to burn the sugar for energy and it produces heat, which is why your body is at like 98 degrees and some change. It's because all your cells are in the process of burning sugar. What happens when you burn something? What does it leave? A residue, but what is it called? Ash. What does ash composed of? Carbon. When we breathe in oxygen, we blow out what? Carbon is the remains of what was burnt in our cells. Our cells deliver and push that carbon out to be delivered from our bloodstream into our lungs so that when we exhale, we blow out that carbon that we just burnt the sugar from. Isn't that neat? See all these trees over here? They do the exact opposite of us. They take in the carbon dioxide, convert it and blow out oxygen. We breathe in oxygen and blow out carbon dioxide. We're keeping them alive. They're keeping up us alive. Amen? Oh, I could talk about this all day. But my body needs insulin. So the sugar's going through the bloodstream. It happens upon a cell. And one of my cells needs some sugar. Now, at, at the gateway to my cell, there is a thing called an insulin receptor. Basically, it's the lock that opens up my cell. And if the insulin, excuse me, if the sugar tries to get into the cell and the insulin receptor is not there working, then the sugar cannot go in and, and I feel weak. I feel like I've got the flu because I'm not burning any sugar. I don't have any energy. Meanwhile, the sugar is pounding away at the cells, which is why those who have diabetes, they often lose their eyesight, they have heart problems, they have neuropathy, they have problems in their feet. Any of the soft cells, they're being destroyed by that sugar. The sugar is just beating its way and it's not able to get in. So the insulin receptor is just like the Levite priest who stands at the gate of the tabernacle. And if something tries to get into that tabernacle that is not approved by the Levite priest, there's going to be trouble. The priest only approves things that are allowed to be burnt on the altar. And in my cell is called a mitochondria, and that's the altar that all of the sacrifices brought in are burnt on. Amen! amen. You, are, you are a living sacrifice, amen. So... How does the DNA double helix turn into insulin? How does it happen? I mean, it's a genetic code. It's in there. The recipe's in there. But then, is it like magic or what? No. Something has to take place. Now, get ready for this. How does a Bible become a saint? The word is preached, but how does that then make a person into a saint of the living God? How does that work? It's a process called DNA transcription. Deuteronomy 17, the law said, it shall be when he, talking about a king, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book. In verse 20, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. The law said that if a man ascended to the throne over Israel, they, the priests, the, the scribes were to give him a big blank paper, a roll of a book, an ink, and a pen, give him a copy of the law of Moses, and tell him, you need to write out your own 
copy. So that when you read what you wrote, you'll be reminded that you're a king under God's authority. You cannot make up your own rules. You cannot do things your way. You must follow what is written. Amen. Do you know what's in charge of all the processes of your body right now? It's not your brain. It's your DNA book. Your DNA book is what's making me sweat. It's making you hungry. Making some of you sleepy. But it's the book that is in charge of every process of your body. That's a church where the head is following the book. And each individual member of this body is going to do what the book tells them to do. Amen. Amen. Now watch this. DNA transcription. There is a machine, a bio machine in your body called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase has one function. It goes up and down your DNA scroll. And when it finds the place, Brother Reg, in the scroll where the recipe and the instructions for making insulin is... It stops right there. And then it starts writing out a copy of your DNA that makes insulin. It does not use the originals to do it. It makes a copy of the originals. Which means that the copy of the original has the same force and power as the original does. Give the Lord a hand. This is not beef. They told me in college that the copies all got corrupted. We can't trust any. We, we, and we need scholarship. We need to be critical text scholars to criticize the text to see what God really said. But they don't believe that they're inspired. And they don't believe that they have power. But God just showed you that the copy of the original has the same force and power as the original does. So it copies out this original, and it's just one strand, so it's not DNA, it's RNA. RNA is one strand, DNA is two strand. The RNA strand that it just wrote out and copied, get this, is called messenger RNA. The word messenger comes to us from the Greek word angelos, which means angel. Christ was the messenger, Malachi 3, of the covenant. So whether you're dealing with the original DNA or the copy of the DNA, you're still dealing with Christ, the original word of God. Amen? Amen. Turn to Luke chapter 4. I'm going to show you this. I'll quit in just a minute. Famous last words. I haven't even got into DNA translation yet. He says, don't quit. There's people behind him going, man, I'm starving. <laughs> Yeah. What I what I don't get done here, if I if I throw it in tonight, that's fine. And what I don't get done here, I'm going to go back and record. It'll come out no matter what. It'll come out. I appreciate that. I really do. Look at verse. Look at chapter four, verse seventeen. You're going to see Christ act this out. This blew me away when I saw this. We know that in Luke 4, Christ goes into the synagogue because that's his tradition. And he would go in there and they would often hand him the scroll. Just They still do it this pretty much the same way in Jewish synagogues of this day. There's a reading from the scroll. So they handed him a roll of a book. Okay, And in this case, it's a copy of... Uh, or sort of a prototype of the entire Bible. They hand him the book of Isaiah, which has 66 chapters. The Bible has 66 books. So they're handing him a copy of the entire book. 
Who remembers the day you got saved? Raise your hand. Did somebody come over to you and open up the Bible in Genesis 1 and say, I'm going to read you the entire Bible and then you'll be saved? Thank God. Amen? Because I'm in 1189 chapters. That's a long way. Neither does when your DNA is read, it doesn't produce everything in sequence that the DNA says. It only produces what it needs at that point. So when Christ took the book of the prophet Isaiah, he opened the book, he found the place where it's written. He picked the place. He's reading Isaiah 61 because he knows that he is, he is fulfilling at that exact point what Isaiah 61 says. So in verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus reading this. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, he, if you go back and look at Isaiah 61, he cut it off mid-verse. Mid-sentence, actually. There's a semicolon there. And he stopped reading when he said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, because that's what it happens in your DNA. Once it, a copy has been made, the book is closed, back up and protected. And he closed the book and gave it to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And, it, and I don't have my Bible open to that. But it, when they all looked at him, he said what? This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He knew that he was fulfilling that one segment of the DNA role. And so when somebody came to you and said, I'm going to give you the gospel, they started reading Romans 3.23, for all of sin and come short of the glory. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin. Romans 10.9 and 10. Uh, Ephesians 2.8 and 9. 1 John 1.9. Uh, uh, John 3.16. They didn't give you the whole book. They gave you pieces of it. Because that's what you needed at that time. And when that book was opened up to you and your eyes became aware of it and your heart became aware of it, then you said, yeah, I'm ready to pray to ask Jesus into my heart. Amen. Amen. And God made a saint out of you from that one small segment. That's how much power that book has got. And when Brother Reg comes up here, one of these other preachers that come up here, God has laid on that man's heart something that he knows or may, may even not know what is needed in this congregation, but the Holy Ghost does. The Holy Ghost will not let him preach anything else except what he wants him to. He gets up here and preaches it, and all of a sudden, 15 people uh, come to the altar and they say, Pastor, you have no idea how bad I needed that message. That's because the book's in charge, not him. Amen? All right, let me give you... So that's DNA transcription. It's the same process as, as the scribes of Hebrew and the, the uh, priesthood of the believer in the New Testament. They were copying the Greek words and they knew that they were the words of God. Therefore, they, they strived to get them right. Because in Colossians, Paul says to the Colossians, take this letter, send it to the Laodicean church. And when you get there, they've got a letter that I wrote them. Bring that letter back here. Now, did they bring them the originals? No. Brought them the copies. Now, DNA translation. Mm -mm -mm. So how does that RNA, that messenger RNA, become the protein insulin? Or how does a Bible written in Greek benefit me to save my soul. I've never heard a preacher get up behind the pulpit and read straight out of a Greek Bible and say, that's the Word of God right there, and leave it. Never heard anybody do that. Even though they say, that's the real Bible right there. That's the only perfect Bible. It's the original, original languages. Yet they won't preach it. They won't do it. They don't believe it. They're just lying through their teeth. It, guess what? It's a process called RNA translation. Once the RNA has been transcripted, written exactly the way the original, then the process of translating that genetic code into something real. So what happens is um, 
the RNA is read, the RNA polymerase is reading it, and it reads the, uh, the recipe part. It says, okay, we need this protein here, and we need this protein over here, and we need about four or five of these proteins over here, and about six dozen different proteins it's got to put together in one place, and does it just throw it in a box, shake it up, and say, there's your insulin right here? No. It takes those individual proteins, locks them together in a perfect way, and then it's called uh, protein folding. They, the, the polymerase machine takes the proteins that it's put together, and it's kind of like watching a child taking Play-Doh, and he's making a cup, or he's making a plate, or he's making a horse, or whatever. The RNA polymerase is taking the, the proteins and folding them together into a three-dimensional way, and once it's done, there's your insulin. Okay, and it's called translation. So how does a Greek Bible or a Hebrew Bible become a saint? It must have an interpreter. How many of you have a grandma that had a, a recipe for something that was the best you've ever had and nobody could, nobody could beat it? Amen? And when grandma died, where'd the recipe go? Amen? She, she probably had a book with old recipes that she cut out in it. My Mimo did. So even a recipe, they'll give you the ingredients, but that's not all. They'll give you how to take the ingredients, how to mix them together right, so that you can have this wonderful cake that Meemaw used to make. Amen? Yeah. Every cake needs a Meemaw, right? Yeah. Amen. So, do not interpretations belong to God? Yes, they do. Uh, here, I'm just going to roll through this quickly. Eloi, Eloi, Samachthani, which means it's being interpreted. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, to another, diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. It's a gift of the Spirit, the interpretation of tongues. Over and over and over, the Bible says, let one interpret. So if that DNA is not transcripted right, if it's not translated right, there will be no insulin in my body. There will, however, be poison. Now, I'm going to tell you one story and I'm going to quit. In our county, years ago, and they actually made a movie about this, a young lady named Patricia Stallings, she had a baby, and it got real bad sick. They took it to the hospital, and they, they, they determined that it had uh, ethyl alcohol uh, in its bloodstream. The baby died. The police went to the house. They found old jugs that had some antifreeze in it, and they said, uh-oh, it looks like she fed this baby antifreeze because she's crazy. And so they put her in prison. They held her trial. She had a jerk for a, uh, a lawyer. He didn't do his job. They sentenced her to life imprisonment. But before that, she got pregnant again. She had her second baby while she was in jail. They took that baby away from her. Well, the other baby started exhibiting same symptoms as the previous one. And they said, well, we, we took uh, the baby over there for her to visit. We left her along with the baby so she could feed the baby. And they thought that she somehow got uh, antifreeze in, in the prison and fed that second baby antifreeze. And they charged her again. And boy, I mean, then she's messed up for life now. They're going to they're gonna throw away the key on her. Another lawyer got involved. And he, he sat down with Stallings and, and her husband and, and I think the district attorney and said, do you know the half-life of ethylene glycol, which is what antifreeze is? you know what the half-life is in the body? And he, and he gave the number. I don't remember what it was. But he said what it breaks down to is for that second baby to get sick with the amount they found the amount of basically one tablespoon of ethylene glycol in that baby's blood. And he said, for that baby to have had one tablespoon of that ethylene glycol in its system from the time you fed it until the time they did the blood test, I don't remember what it was. She said she would have had to have given this baby like 100 gallons of antifreeze in order for it to break down into a tablespoon left. And they let her go. They found out that both of her children had something wrong in their genes 
and made their bodies produce ethylene glycol. She sued the lab and won a ton of money, and she used that money to put billboards all over Jefferson County, do not vote this prosecutor back in, signed Patricia Stallings, and he lost the election. But see, my point is this. If this doesn't get transcribed right, if it doesn't get translated right, it's poison. It's poison. And is it poisoning our churches right now? The, the vine of Sodom is the reason why all of our churches are favoring the Sodomites, the cross-dressers, no longer using uh, male and female pronouns. They're, they're caving into them because they're drinking the wine of Sodom. Look up Deuteronomy 32. The wine of Sodom will produce the fruit of Sodom. No pun intended, but it will. You don't want that in your family. You don't want that in your church. You don't want that in your life. Father, I pray your blessings on these people. I thank you, Lord, for their forbearing with me. Lord, I thank you, dear God, for this blessed book. Lord, you've saved my life. You've saved my family. You've saved my ministry. You've saved my reputation. You've saved everything that's worth saving in me from this one book, and I thank you for it. Lord, this book is the one my grand both of my grandmothers had. This book is the one that was given to me by my preacher forefathers down through the years. Given down to me, Lord, and it's my responsibility to hand it down to the next generation the same way I got it, unchanged, untainted, uncorrupted. Father, and it will abide forever. Let it abide forever in the hearts of these people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. love you. Thank you very much. This is the kind of thing that makes camp meeting special. You just can't hear this everywhere, every day. And uh, the first time I met him, I had preached a message on, I will not sell my vineyard. Yep. And the Lord uh, knitted our hearts together over this issue of the Bible. And uh, I, I want to tell you in, in, in hillbilly simplicity, that the difference, give me a copy. We got your Bible there handy somewhere. Uh, Heard it goes. Yeah, yeah. The difference is this. Never put your mind over this book. Put this book over your mind. And that takes a uh, just a conscious decision because you can't answer all the questions that are out there and all the nonsense that's said. But you just have a simplicity, childlike faith that what God says is real and true. And I will tell you this, that you can't get by changing a Bass Pro catalog. They'll come after you. You don't... You don't say, I'm going to give you $70 for this 80, uh, $185 reel. You're going to go by their book or you ain't going to do business with them. You wouldn't even try that. And especially you wouldn't want anybody messing with your will. Amen. This is God's will. It is. Testament. And uh, I will say this to you. There's a great, great movement and people are, uh, but I just want to uh, take it for simplicity. I, I, I wouldn't know a DNA if I saw it, I guess. But aren't you glad God wrote all that and yeah, did all that? Amen. Let's stand together.